Good morning. Christ is in our midst. Reverend clergy, esteemed members of the Archon National Council, fellow Archons, fellow Orthodox stewards and friends, welcome and thank you for attending the sixth Archon Symposium in the Philadelphia region. My name is Carrie Limbarakis, and I am the one to whom you have sent your RSVP. I couldn't help but notice from the last names of those attending that we have quite a diverse group of Orthodox Christians representing several jurisdictions. Who of you among here are Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian, Serbian, Romanian, Bulgarian, Georgian, Coptic, OCA. We welcome you all. We also have attendees who have traveled quite a distance. Where are you from? Boston? Washington, D.C.? Upstate New York? New Jersey? One of our presenters is from Washington State, so she wins. <laughs> and again, welcome one and all. Since this, is, since this symposium is being hosted by the Order of St. Andrew the Apostle, Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, District 7, I'd like to begin our presentation today with an explanation of what an Archon is since some of you may not be familiar with the term or title. An archon, or archon from the Greek, is an honorary by His All Holiness the Ecumenical Patriarch for his outstanding service to the Church and a well-known, distinguished, and well-respected leader of the Orthodox Church at large. It is by the grace of God that the archon has been able to offer his good works and deeds of faith. It is the sworn oath of the Archon to defend and promote the Orthodox Church faith and tradition. His main concern is to protect and promote the Holy Patriarchate and its mission. He is also concerned with human rights and the well-being and general welfare of the Church. As it is a significant religious position, the faith and dedication of a candidate for the role are extensively reviewed during consideration. The candidate should have demonstrated commitment for the betterment of the church, the parish, diocese, archdiocese, patriarchate, and the community as a whole. The Order of St. Andrew the Apostle of the Ecumenical Patriarchate was first organized on the Sunday of Orthodoxy, March 10, 1966, by His Eminence Archbishop Yaakovos of Blessed Memory. Conferred upon 30 outstanding laymen of the Church the various ophicia, or offices or titles, of the Ecumenical Patriarchate on behalf of His All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Athenagoras, also of Blessed Memory. Those upon whom this title of the Mother Church has been conferred are known as Archons of the Great Church of Christ. According to ecclesiastical tradition, Andrew, the first called apostle, began his missionary activity in the provinces of Vithynia and Pontus on the southern shore of the Black Sea. Later, he journeyed to the city of Byzantium and founded the Christian church there. Hence, he is deemed the patron saint of our order. As defenders of the faith, the Order of St. Andrew's special concern is to protect the ecumenical patriarchate, and to that end, it has developed a multifaceted global strategy to address the religious freedom deficit in Turkey, which has pervaded that country since its inception following World War I. The five key issues 
confronting the ecumenical patriarchate are, one, Turkish government interference in patriarchal elections. Two, non-recognition of the ecumenical status of the patriarch. He's not a local bishop. Three, the ecumenical patriarchate has no legal identity in that country. Four, the closure of the Halki Theological Seminary and the inability to train new clergy. And five, confis confiscation of property, which the Turkish government has many properties that belong to the ecumenical patriarchate. In your folders, there is further elaboration regarding these points of contention. Read what we're up against in trying to achieve the basic human right of religious freedom. As I mentioned earlier, it is the sworn oath of the Archon to defend and promote the Orthodox Church and tradition. Today we're going to focus on the promote part. A few months ago, when I was scheduled to attend a dental conference in Chicago, my daughter Kira asked if I wouldn't mind staying an extra day or two to join her in attending a religious seminar. Kira had become a board member of the St. Phoebe Center for the Deaconess, but up to that point, I wasn't really familiar with the activities or mission of that organization. Anyway, the seminar reflected upon the 30-year anniversary of one ecumenical patriarch, Demetrius I, convened an international Orthodox consultation on the islands of Rhodes, Greece, to explore the ministry and ordination of women in the Orthodox Church. Notable among its concluding recommendations was the call to revive the female diaconate. I was, ast I was ast astounded. I was not aware of this recommendation at all, as I'm sure many, if not all of you, are not aware of this recommendation. When the program was over, I came to the conclusion that a female diaconate could only help orthodoxy. And I was compelled to act, to do something to promote this jewel of our orthodox heritage. Remembering that as an archon, my duty was to promote our faith, I decided to have a female diaconate as the theme for the next archon symposium here in Philadelphia. Utilizing my vast network of con connections, I consulted my daughter, Kira, <laughs> on who to have as our speakers. Friends, we have a great panel of speakers who will enlighten you, inspire you, and provoke you to think about reviving something that's been lost but can be returned hopefully in our lifetime, and with a great moderator who many of you know who will guide us through these discussions. Before I introduce our moderator, I would like to make an appeal. As you've heard, the Order of St. Andrew the Apostle has a monumental task in achieving religious freedom in Turkey for our ecumenical patriarchate. We would greatly appreciate donations of any amount to the order to help realize that goal, as well as to help fund programs such as this. Thank you. I would also like to express our thanks to the community of St. Sophia, and Father Peter in particular, for their graciously opening their doors to us and accommodating us. Thank you. And to our caterer, Eleni Evangelopoulos, Mediterranean caterers, who has prepared for us a delicious Lenten, a Lenten feast. It sounds almost incongruous. <laughs> and lastly, to our videographer, Mark Berryman, and our audio man, Jack Melbaum. Yes, the program is being recorded in order to spread the word. It gives me great pleasure at this time to introduce to you this morning our moderator, 
He is the Father John Meyendorf and Patterson Family Chair of Orthodox Christian Studies, co-founding director of the Orthodox Christian Center, Studies Center at Fordham University in the Bronx, New York, and co-founding editor of the Journal of Orthodox Christian Studies. Please welcome Archon George Dimakopoulos. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Father Peter, um, St. Sophia, thank you for your fabulous hospitality. Um, uh, Carrie, thank you. Uh, I think your brother would be upset that you didn't mention that I'm also the historian for the Order of St. Andrew. <laughs> your CV was too long. <laughs> That's right. Um, anyway, I, I'm really delighted to be here. I, I was saying to someone just a couple minutes ago, um, I, I didn't have anything to do with the organization of this panel. I simply said yes. Um, and, um, but if I had been asked who should speak at a panel like this, we would end up with the exact group of scholars um, that, that we have. Um, so Kira's network is clearly um, <laughs> world class and she knows exactly, exactly who to invite. So my role is really simple. I'm going to serve as the moderator today. I realize that uh, people in the audience have um, quite different um, degrees of information about the history of the diaconate. So I'm going to take about five minutes to simply provide a very, very brief historical overview. And then our speakers are really going to fill in the details. And I do promise there will be lots of time for questions, conversation, and so forth. Right? We very much envision this as a dialogue and a kind of continuing education kind of event. So very brief historical overview. We may not realize this. But there is an order of female deacons evident in the New Testament. In the book of Romans, St. Phoebe is identified as a deaconess. St. Paul addresses her, right? So right there in the oldest apostolic community in the center of the Roman Empire, there were women serving as deacons. Okay? That history of a female diaconate is very well attested in the uh, Greek-speaking areas of the Roman Empire, especially in Constantinople. So, for example, when St. John Chrysostom is the Archbishop of Constantinople in the, fourth century, in the latter part of the 4th century, the beginning of the 5th century, one of his closest associates is a woman by the name of St. Olympias. St. Olympias was a deaconess of the church. Among other things, she was responsible for the catechismal instruction of adult female converts to the faith. In the late 4th century, the majority of baptisms that were occurring were still adults. And it's not just that she served it, uh, in part of the ritual of the baptism, but she actually had responsibility for the education of the catechumenate. When St. John Chrysostom is sent into exile, which ultimately leads to his death, he actually writes several letters to Olympias, St. Olympias, giving advice and instruction about how to carry forth in her ministry and so forth. He, she really is one of his closest confidants. Later historical evidence in Byzantium attests to very precise canonical uh, regulations about what type of woman can be ordained to the diaconate. Um, and so forth. So we have church canons that speak of, not against, <laughs> but speak of the reality of a female diaconate and offer some prescriptions um, for, their, uh, for who can be ordained and so forth. Um, and we also have 
actual liturgical rites. What I mean by that is we literally have the text of the ordination service for female deacons. And the experts can tell me better than I can. I I simply know this exists. I haven't actually worked my way through it. But I believe, with the exception of one concluding prayer, maybe it's two, the right for a female deacon is identical to the right for a male deacon. So we know in Byzantium that this happened, that it was common, and so forth. Um, The order apparently died out around the 12th century, maybe the 13th century. We don't really know why. I have my own hunches. I will let the experts talk about that. If we come to this, maybe I'll give my hunches as to why it dies out. Um, But it does die out around the time of the Fourth Crusade. Okay? So we have basically a 1,300-year history, 1,200-year history, of the presence of female female deacons in the Greek-speaking Orthodox Church. There's evidence for it elsewhere as well, as as we'll hear. In the modern world, because people who study this know that this existed in the past, there have been some attempts, some uh, some not so recent and some very recent, to revive the institution. Um, Many in the Greek tradition are... um, familiar with St. Nectarios, um, uh, Greek bishop of Aena, I believe. He he ordained female deacons. He was a bishop, and he ordained deacons um, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, I think most interestingly, the Russian Orthodox Church, which by numbers now is dwarfs the size of of other churches, uh, the Russians had never had a tradition of female deacons, but at a very important church council on the eve of the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, the council deliberated about the need to restore a female diaconate and introduce it to the Russian church, and this was the plan, and then the Bolsheviks took over. And the whole thing fell apart just like everything else um, in in the Russian church. Um, And then finally, and most tantalizingly, and I hope we're going to hear a little bit about this uh, today, in the last two years, the patriarch of Alexandria has revived a form of the female diaconate in Africa. Um... I think there are still a lot of questions about what exactly is happening and what the roles of these women are, uh, what role they're playing, and so forth. Um, This has gotten a lot of attention, and I suspect that we will be speaking a fair amount about what is happening in Africa as a possible prelude to what is happening in the United States, what could happen in the United States and elsewhere. Um, The final thing I'll say is that we do have, um, this is getting a lot of attention, there's a lot of momentum. The St. Phoebe Center is really um, pioneering in this, we're going to hear a little bit more about the St. Phoebe Center later. Um, One of the, uh, something that we have at Fordham um, called Public Orthodoxy is an online editorial forum. And about this time last year, we published a series of pieces uh, that came from a conference that the St. Phoebe Center had sponsored. Um, And so you can see that that we really are getting um, a lot of attention and a lot of traction to this issue as more and more people find out about it. Um, I think one of the most unfortunate aspects of this debate is people really do not know the history, right? The vast majority of Orthodox Christians in the United States simply do not, and globally, simply do not know that the Orthodox Church had an order of female deacons for a thousand years. And there are forces in the modern church who see any conversation about the Restoration 
as some kind of capitulation to the culture war, to feminism, to, to what have you. Um, and that's, to my mind, that is simply because they are either unable or unwilling to actually explore the tradition and the history of the church. Uh, I suspect that we will talk more about this as the day goes on. So that's my overview. So my task now, first, is to introduce our first speaker, who happens to be in Australia. Um, Archdeacon Father John Crisivis, who is really an exceptional scholar uh, and a leading voice within the ecumenical patriarchate and an enormous friend of the Order of St. Andrew, um, was going to offer our first address here, but as um, one of the closest and most trusted associates of the ecumenical patriarch, he was sent to Australia this week somewhat unexpectedly because the primate of the Greek church in Australia, um, Stylianos, passed away this week. And so the archdeacon is representing the ecumenical patriarch at that funeral this weekend. However, Archdeacon John was kind enough to record by video the address he was going to deliver here. So we are going to begin with Archdeacon John's address about the diaconate um, where he, I believe, is going to lay out a kind of broader vision of the role of the diaconate in general, not just the role of female deacons. So we will begin with that video, um, and then we will uh, continue with our morning. Thank you. Let me first of all express my sincere apologies for not being able to be with you at this symposium organized by the Order of St. Andrew the Apostle, on reviving the female diaconate in the Orthodox Church. Second, at the suggestion of Kira Limbarakis, who is the inspiration behind this event, I am trying to set up a kind of YouTube recording that I normally use. I turn to YouTube when I'm looking up how to unclog drains in my bathroom. But I suppose we could imagine this symposium as a small step in unclogging hardened habits in our church in order to allow the fresh springs of the Spirit to flow, as in the early apostolic community. And finally, since I'm not with you, I would like to add a final point that I intended to amplify in our discussion. Everything that I mention in my paper can be applied to the female diaconate, in my humble opinion, there is absolutely nothing that a deacon does, at least in the way I perceive the diaconate, that cannot be accomplished by women deacons. However, I firmly believe that we will not be able to appreciate the place of women deacons in the church unless we first understand the role of the diaconate in general. And that's why my address focuses on providing a fresh look at the diaconate in Christ. And let me open with two personal remarks. The first, an anecdote. The second, a personal confession. I recall a striking image of the important role that deacons have in our church from an experience not too long ago in Constantinople. Following Lenten supper, the ecumenical patriarch entered a small chapel where some of the clergy were waiting to commence the nightly compline service. And as his All Holiness looked around, he was amazed to find seven deacons and not a single priest. All of the priests were on assignment elsewhere. Sensing his surprise, I cheekily said, Your All Holiness, this is exactly what the church should look like. Lots of deacons, only some priests, and even fewer bishops. Let's not forget that while providing a useful and helpful analogy for us today, Justinian's paradigm of 60 priests, 100 deacons, 40 deaconesses, and 90 subdeacons reflected 
cutbacks in 6th century Constantinople. And yet, as I looked around, it occurred to me that each of these deacons had a very special and a very specific ministry. One served in the private patriarchal office, another as his archdeacon in liturgy and administration. I served in the United States. Another was deputy secretary of the Holy Synod, and another was an office scribe. The remaining two worked in the library and the English office. Moreover, what was evident was that these clergy had served as deacons for many years. There's a long tradition of diaconal ministry at the Fanar. My point here is these clergymen did not have to be priests in order to be ordained, and they did not have to be priests in order to carry out ministry. It was extraordinary, I would say even inspiring, to watch as the patriarch moved to the front, vested the priestly stole, an unassuming but compelling sign that he too had a precise and distinct role at that moment, beyond any official title or institutional office. As St. John Chrysostom reminds us, even bishops are called deacons. And here is my confession. In fact, an act of thanksgiving in the definition of confession in the Psalms. I did not intend to become a deacon. Perhaps, unlike most ordained clergymen, I became a deacon by serendipity, not selection. Coincidentally, not conscientiously. At the same time, however, while I cringe when people tell me that they were called to become priests, I believe that I was actually called to become a deacon, a conviction I embraced in 1984 when my bishop, uh, to whose funeral I am headed today as you hold your symposium, my bishop in Australia asked if I would be ordained and remain a deacon in order to serve the church expressly in the ministries of education and administration. This is why several years ago, in a meeting of Orthodox bishops held in Chicago, I felt that one hierarch touched on the heart of ordination as vocation when he asked me, is someone even called to the diaconate? Do we not normally say that people are called to the priesthood? I remain convinced today, as I replied then, that one is not called to the diaconate any more than one is not called to the priesthood and not called, certainly, to the episcopate. We are called primarily to the royal priesthood, to the priestly ministry of all believers. That may surprise you because you may be wondering why on earth so many people feel they are called to the priesthood, enter seminary, and then are ordained. What I am simply saying is that this is not the proper starting point. These are not the right questions when it comes to vocation. You see, I learned from a young age from my presbyter father that our noblest task is to become followers of Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. This implies that our noblest goal is to be Christians, not deacons, not priests, and certainly not bishops. And the journey to become disciples of Christ begins at the moment of baptism. St. Ignatius of Antioch prayed not only to be called a Christian, but also to be found a Christian. I would argue that the sacrament of ordination is actually much easier to reach than the sacrament of baptism is to undergo. There is something else that I also learned over many years in church administration, parish ministry, and theological education, namely that the priesthood has become the cause of much confusion and much suffering, much abuse and much anxiety resulting from a misunderstanding of authority in the church. And this is a problem encountered both by clergy and laity. That's why I believe that understanding the diaconate allows us to better understand all three orders of the priesthood. 
But unfortunately, tradition and convention have an uncanny way of obscuring the original and theological reasons for which the early church defined the threefold ministry and perceived the diaconate. But toward the end of the first century, Ignatius of Antioch asserted that the church realizes its unity most completely, most comprehensively, only when the community is, uh, I quote, with the bishop and the presbyters and the deacons. Without these, St. Ignatius adds, the community cannot even be called a church. As the early church expanded and extended into the 4th century, the golden age of the diaconate, deacons played more meaningful and multiple roles. But deacons were never considered novices or apprentices. There was never an indication or implication that deacons were a condition or obligation for elevation to priesthood. Only recently I saw uh, an article in the Church of Greece where someone was promoted, rewarded, it said, rewarded for his 25 years of diaconate by being elevated to the priesthood. That's not how I see the diaconate. And so in the 7th century, Isidore of Seville would say, without the ministry of deacons, the priest has the name, but not the office. The priest consecrates and sanctifies, but the deacon dispenses and shares. So we need an alternative concept of priesthood in the church. Unfortunately, over the centuries, we've misconceived, even distorted the ministry, focusing more on the aspect of authority and grace rather than on the practice of service and sacrifice. Deacons became transitional and dispensable, in many cases almost symbolical and invisible. And while this phenomenon was never restricted to a particular region or a particular period, the Church of Russia even sought on several occasions during the 19th century to eliminate the diaconate entirely, while no more credible a theologian than Father George Florovsky saw little, if any, purpose or prospect for the restoration of the diaconate. And so seminarians are ordained to the priesthood after serving only briefly as deacons, as if they are somehow expected to move on or move up. The diaconate has been reduced to a stepping stone for the priesthood, just as the celibate priesthood is for the episcopate, the latter two stages somehow considered more significant for the ordained ministry, whereas the diaconate is reduced to a sub-priesthood, rarely perceived as a lifelong or permanent office. I would argue that there is something seriously missing from the ordained ministry if deacons are undervalued or omitted in the overall picture. A fuller vision of ministry should equally recognize the role of the bishop as bond of unity, the role of the presbyter as celebrant of sacraments, and the role of the deacon as completing this circle of community. We really need an alternative vision of the priesthood, understood from the following three perspectives. First, the image of the church that we should have in our mind and in our conversation is that of a dinner table, not that of a corporate ladder. The church is not a pyramid where all attention and authority are focused somehow on the summit. We should imagine the church as a sacrament where the focus is on the Eucharist, on the cup, where the least is greatest, the last is first, and the leader is servant. And if this is our icon of the church, then we can well imagine deacons as waiting at tables or serving community needs rather than as pawns at the bottom of some institution. Second, I propose a circular approach to ordination and ministry. Try to recall the movements of a deacon in liturgy, constantly moving inside and outside the altar, between the gospel or the chalice and the congregation or the communicants. It's actually been estimated that the deacons take almost 3,000 steps during a liturgy. Uh, good reason, I would say, for the deacons to be covered by uh, health insurance. But think of these movements. 
Deacons are mediators between clergy and laity, striving to hold together and to reconcile the church and the world. This constant motion of the deacon defines this go-between dimension of the diaconate. Think of servants, deacons, moving between the master and the guests at the feast in Cana of Galilee in John chapter 2. Think of the angels ministering as deacons after Christ's temptations in the desert in Matthew 4. Think of the deacons as described as being ambassadors of the church to the world by Ignatius of Antioch in Philadelphians 10. This betweenness also explains the ambiguity of the deacon's status as clergy and laity, while at the same time neither clergy nor laity, an ambiguity that I believe reflects the fundamental and essential nature of the church, which is in the world, but not of the world. And third, let me draw your attention to another perspective. When we adopt a linear approach to the church, we tend to think of the apostolic succession of bishops, that unbroken line of continuity with the early disciples. But we should not only reflect on the historical dimension of the church, we should also remember the horizontal dimension of the church that includes all of its members, all of its concerns. The church was always at its best when it embraced the whole world. And the church was clearly at its worst when it isolated itself from the world. So we need to widen our concept of the diaconate, of ministry, of church. And by breadth, I mean fullness. I mean the plenitude of the church, which implies the diversity of gifts expressed in all the members of the church, in the royal priesthood of believers that are referred to earlier. And these gifts include talents and skills of baptized believers who should be enlisted sacramentally, ministerially, by the church. That is, for me, what calling signifies. It's not some presumption, arrogant at worst, ignorant at best, of an otherworldly enlightenment to save the world, but the discernment by the church of particular abilities, specific aptitudes in the community. It's a chrismation of these charismata in the church. That's how I understand, I understand Paul's letter to the Corinthians in chapter 12 about the variety of gifts, multitude of services within the body of Christ. And so, for example, matters of pastoral care, practical administration, financial concern, even theological education could easily, rightfully, be delegated to deacons. Here is my vision. Someone whose administrative gifts are welcomed for the organization, organization of a parish could be, should be, ordained to perform this task in the community, serving as a deacon, either part-time or full-time in that capacity. The same would occur with someone proficient in youth ministry or fundraising, in catechism or chaplaincy, in pastoral care or social work, and so on. Deacons may also be called, may be commissioned to preach, to teach, to counsel, to perform parish or community services. And so in this way, ministerial dignity, ministerial office would be conferred on these individuals, while their particular strengths would be formally incorporated, solemnly integrated within the community. They would be empowered, ordained through an imposition of hands and by the grace of the Spirit, their various charismata sacramentally bound to the holy altar. You see, the fundamental and essential question in our minds should be, does someone have to be a priest in order to do what he is doing? Ordained is one thing. Ordained a priest is another. Restoring and reviving the diaconate could thus have profound significance and consequences for our parishes and their ministries. Complementing, not competing with, complementing the priesthood. 
Let me flesh this out a little more. Organising an event like yours is a deacon's work. The work of the OCMC Executive Director, director is a diaconia, not the ministry of a priest. The CEO of IOCC should be a deacon, not a layman. Perhaps more controversially, teaching at a theological faculty, teaching at an Orthodox seminary like Holy Cross or St. Vladimir's, is a deacon's calling, not a priest's, not a layperson's. Otherwise, it complicates, it confounds matters of education with matters of spiritual direction. Facilitating a youth office or a camp program of a diocese is a diaconia, not the training or waiting ground for candidates to the priesthood. Chaplains and counsellors on campuses, military bases, hospitals, prisons should be ordained deacons. Perhaps choir directors, parish outreach leaders, young adult ministers, adult educators, stewardship officers, these are specific services optimally suited for deacons. Now, I'm not saying that all of these ministries are reasons for ordination to the diaconate, but they are certainly not reasons for exclusion from the diaconate. All of these vital ministries may sometimes seem like they are on the margins of the church, but we should remember that the history of the church is often written on the margins of the world, not behind the closed doors of a synod. So I'm arguing that our understanding of the priesthood and the church should be turned somehow upside down, beginning not from the top down, but springing from the fundamental, foundational notion of diaconia and the grassroots level of ecclesia. That's how our faithful will appreciate what matters most in the ministry of the church. A revival of the diaconate can also generate a revitalization of our parishes, which would become increasingly global, less insular, because the diaconate will not just be rooted in the apostolic experience, it would reflect a very modern expression and awaken very fresh ministries, unrestricted by traditional reproductions. You see, Beyond authority and bureaucracy in the church, beyond leadership and management in the parish, there is the priceless dimension of service and serving. Beyond celebrating liturgy and sacraments in the holy altar, there is attending to human beings as the living altar of the body of Christ. And deacons symbolize Actually, I would say deacons realize the evangelical precept of service. When the disciples asked Jesus about priorities and privileges, he reminded them that they were not to seek positions of power in order to dominate others, nor were they given any assurance of entitlement or authority on earth or in heaven. They were asked whether they were prepared to share Christ's suffering and death. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be servant of all. And deacons were always closer to the humble laity than the other clergy. Being familiar with the wider community, they were the eyes and ears of the bishop. Understanding the struggles of the parishioners, they were able to prepare the prothesis and recite the intercessions. And in dismissing the congregation after Eucharist, they were sending them back into the world as witnesses to the kingdom and its righteousness. In a word, the deacon's role is administrative, serving alongside, supporting, sustaining the ministry, reinforcing the church as collegial, as communal, as collaborative. Their task was to discern and facilitate the ministry of all people, assisting and providing for them in their challenges, enhancing and enriching 
community and unity in the church. That's precisely why, whereas bishops are normally recognized as saints by virtue of uh, merely being bishops, deacons are always acknowledged for their specific service in the church, whether as martyrs, as confessors, as evangelizers, or as philanthropists. Their unique charisma or office is their distinctive diaconia, or service, in the ministry of the church. And so deacons were especially responsible organizing and administering charitable programs for the suffering. After all, the church is expected to be fully present, most especially where people are vulnerable, to stand among those who are marginalized, to relieve the hungry and thirsty, to welcome the homeless and foreigner. That's an aspect of the church we often forget. The higher up we tend to go. Deacons established social and financial structures where outcasts were accepted. The needy were fed. That's what gives heart and hope to the church, the aconia. And ultimately, this community becomes a visible sign, a tangible icon of the alternative justice of the heavenly kingdom that we all seek. Thank you.